In this talk, I'll be telling you about our experimental work, which we carried out to help us understand the preservation of archaeological materials in Pleistocene cave sediments in the humid tropics. In the tropics, high temperatures and humidity increase weathering rates. This means archaeological materials are often removed from more exposed areas in the landscapes. Caves are sheltered spaces that may mitigate these processes to some extent, and this leaves caves as the key resource for prehistoric archaeologists who are working in tropical regions such as Southeast Asia. Caves are dynamic spaces, and the sediment records they contain often have complex depositional and post-depositional histories. To overcome the difficulties these complex records can pose to site interpretation, geoarchaeologists take an earth sciences approach to understanding the human past. We seek to disentangle the complex mix of anthropogenic and environmental signals that are contained in cave sediments, and we do that by using a combination of techniques that were developed in geology and soil science. While cave sediments are well studied at higher latitudes, the effects of tropical environments upon site formation processes have been little explored, and there is a need for reference data sets related to the geomorphic processes that are active in tropical cave mouths. Bat guano is a material that commonly affects the preservation of archeological materials in caves. When humans abandon a cave, bats may move in, the guano they deposit contains chemical signals that can record shifts in climate and vegetation across the catchment, but their excrement can become extremely acidic and may destroy bones, ashes and other materials left behind by prehistoric humans. Because guano is loaded with phosphates, it decomposes and dissolves archaeological materials but forms orthogenic phosphate minerals. Individual phosphate mineral species often form under very particular conditions and so provide useful paleoenvironmental and taphonomic indicators when discovered at archaeological sites. At Con Mong Cave, an important late Pleistocene archaeological site in North Vietnam, we find a very wet guano deposit with some unusual features. We thought the guano deposit had been waterlogged in the past, and this might have prevented the formation of an acidic environment. We couldn't be certain, and the unknown effects of such environments upon assemblage preservation meant we couldn't assess the taphonomy of archaeological materials at that site. Similar features have been reported at other archaeological sites in Southeast Asia, so it's likely that resolving this issue will have wider relevance. We designed this modern analogue study with three research questions in mind. First, can waterlogging and subsequent aeration produce suites of features similar to those observed at Khon Mong Cave and other Southeast Asian sites? Second, how does waterlogging affect sedimentary environments and the preservation of archaeological materials in guano deposits? And thirdly, to what extent do tropical environmental factors influence the nature or pace of post-depositional processes in archaeological cave sediments? To do this, we had to create our own soaking wet guano deposit and observe its effects ourselves. We started by creating 24 identical samples, each containing two rows of archaeological analogues, bones, carbonates, clays, wood and charcoal. These were laid out on a quartz sand base and buried in waterlogged guano and sealed. We could then excavate one of these per month, providing a time series data set of changes in the burial environment over a two year period. The samples were kept under simulated tropical conditions in an oven set to 30 degrees centigrade. A further series of nine samples were designed to control for the effects of environmental factors, including moisture levels, temperature and burial medium. As the experiment progressed, we monitored changes in the burial environment by using calibrated probes to record parameters such as pH, 
redox potential, and electroconductivity. Excavated materials were subject to a range of microscopic techniques of investigation that helped us to understand the nature of the chemical and mineralogical changes that affected them in the burial environment. Micromorphology is a technique that was originally developed to study soil formation. We only excavated half of each sample and we soaked the other half in fiberglass resin to preserve its structure, then cut it down to geological thin section thickness. This technique provides a powerful way of contextualizing material and of analyzing the post-depositional mineralogical and chemical changes that affect the buried analogues. While light microscopy of thin section samples is powerful, scanning electron microscopy of thin section samples allows even higher resolution imaging. Energy dispersive spectroscopy provides information on the elemental makeup of investigated materials and combined with backscattered scanning electron microscopy, this provides a powerful tool for differentiating between the complex mixtures of orthogenic minerals that are found in cave sediments. FTIR is a spectroscopic technique that provides data which is useful when interpreting the elemental data produced by SEM EDS. It provides information on the structural chemistry of investigated materials and can be used to great effect in compound identification and in the assessment of diagenetic changes that affect archaeological assemblages. Sedimentary environments in the experimental samples became anoxic rapidly as microbial communities used up all the available oxygen. Their respiration was evident from a pungent smell of hydrogen sulfide, which could be smelled several rooms away. Their action created extremely reducing conditions, but at pH remained alkaline. FTIR allowed us to observe the organic decomposition of the guano, which was associated with the formation of potassium sulfate. This mineral was visible as crystals on dried guano samples. Surprisingly, although our waterlogged guano samples did not become acidic, we noted severe diagenetic changes affecting buried bone from just one month onwards. It was difficult to differentiate between the surface modifications that affected bone in subsequent months, but by cross-sectioning excavated samples, we revealed that the patterns of bone degradation were associated with bone structural features in the bone mineral. In thin section, we noted some very unusual patterns of bone degradation, with exfoliation-like weathering patterns proceeding along lamellae and osteons. It was evident that bone was being destroyed and replaced with reddish-brown orthogenic minerals. Scanning electron microscopy of degrading mammal bone revealed that as the bone dissolved, new minerals were forming in the internal voids and within the bone mineral matrix. Surprisingly, some of these minerals appear to contain more silica than phosphate. Fish vertebra showed similar patterns of degradation and orthogenic mineral replacement. Elemental mapping using electron density scanning provides us with some more information about the orthogenic minerals. Interestingly, these orthogenic minerals have chemical signatures that are similar to clays. The mechanisms driving these post-depositional changes in this strange sedimentary environment remain somewhat unclear. Bacteria were obviously a dominant control on sedimentary environmental change, particularly sulfate reducing bacteria. Proving their direct influence on processes of mineralization is a lot more difficult, but we have some evidence that they may have been involved. Some possible biomorphs are preserved in orthogenic minerals that are forming in dissolving carbonate rock, which you can see on this slide. This is not conclusive evidence, 
but it's certainly another piece of the puzzle. Comparisons between the excavated material from our control samples show that simulated tropical conditions greatly accelerated the rate of post-depositional change. But it was micro-environmental factors, and particularly burial medium, that governed the nature of post-depositional change. The most severe changes we observed were associated with organic decomposition in moist environments. And these results further underscore the importance of guano as a taphonomic agent in archaeological caves. Overall, we can say the features that we observed in our experimental samples bore a striking resemblance to those that we observed in the guano deposit at Conlong Cave. This means that we can assume that our experimental samples and experimental conditions are a reasonable analogue for understanding what Conlong Cave was like in the past and how that environment would have affected the preservation of archaeological materials. In conclusion, our novel experimental method provides a way of more conclusively relating micromorphological features from archaeological sites to past environmental conditions. Our experiment shows that the unusual features observed in Conlong Cave likely result from waterlogging and very wet conditions in the early stages of burial. That means these features can be useful as environmental indicators when they're found in other sites. Interestingly, the diagenetic processes is in anoxic waterlogged guano may be quite different from those that occur in aerobic acidic guano deposits. And while our research suggests that bacteria may be intimately involved with the early stages of guano-driven diagenesis under such conditions, further work is necessary to constrain their precise role. Thank you for listening to this talk. If you would like to learn more about our work in Conlong Cave, or about the experimental work that formed the basis of this talk, uh, I refer you to these articles and our forthcoming article in Journal of Archaeological Science Reports.